God with you. We're in Luke chapter 6, starting in verse 46. Just a few verses there. Uh, toward the end of that, it's the conclusion of the sermon. Then we'll get into chapter 7. I put some study questions uh, for you to look and kind of see where we're going there. I'll be referring to those uh, as we go along. Thank you again for, for your interest in the Word of God. Uh, let's be good students of it. Let's practice what we find there. In Luke 6, 46 through 49, depending on maybe a Bible uh, outline, my section here, the heading is Build on the Rock. If you compare Matthew chapter 7, verses 24 through 27, the conclusion of the Sermon on the Mount, uh, this reads very similarly. The question is asked, a little bit different in Luke 6, 46, Why did you call me Lord, Lord, and do not the things which I say? What a powerful principle, what a great question. It's not enough just to, to call Jesus Lord. Uh, now, a person who doesn't call Jesus Lord, obviously that's an issue, but, but to merely call him Lord and think that's enough or sufficient without following what he said is, is insufficient. And so uh, Jesus knows that, uh, that believers back then and now, uh, the crucial thing is what are we doing with the, the things that he said? And so Jesus gives an analogy, gives an illustration, paints a picture of what hearing and following the words of Jesus is like. Look at this. Most of us can relate to uh, maybe structures that are built uh, on a faulty foundation. Those have not stood the test of time. You think about, you see pictures here, even storms. Uh, there were not hurricanes affecting the Middle East in the first century, but uh, as we can think about uh, a great storm and then a building withstanding something like that, a house, uh, would depend on the foundation. Look at the way Jesus puts it here in Luke 6, verse 47. Whoever comes to me and hears my sayings and does them. Notice three things right there as we pause. Comes to me. Uh, I'm, I'm insufficient if I don't even come to Jesus, but here's my words. That's step number two. So there's the entrance and there's the hearing and then the heeding, the doing them. He is like a man building a house, dug deep, laid the foundation on the rock. And when the flood arose, the stream beat vehemently against that house and could not shake it, for it was founded on the rock. They would build on the rock back then. We have different construction methods. Most of our houses are on something like a, a concrete foundation or a footer. Uh, houses built on beaches that are uh, susceptible to hurricanes. Uh, will have pilings. They'll go deep into uh, often sandy soil or something that's it's not like a bedrock at all. And so uh, we understand the, the importance of that. If you were to, to erect a house today and just kind of uh, just find a little grassy spot there and, and just lay some boards down, can you imagine how uh, how the first uh, big wind would be uh, enough to, to knock something like that off? Down in Jamaica, in Port Antonio, there's a large, and in fact, the ruins of a large mansion. It's called the Folly Mansion. Back in the turn of the century, back in the 1900s, a uh, wealthy, uh, I forget the, the man's name and his business exactly, but uh, had a, a new wife, wanted to build a mansion in Jamaica. And so, uh, I think he was from uh, up north, might have been Massachusetts or somewhere like that, but, but they loved the area. And among some of the traditions there is the foundation might have been built with salt water. Uh, and so this structure um, became dilapidated, was not kept up. And so you can see the ruins. Again, uh, the partial wall still standing. And others think that it wasn't exactly the foundation issues. It's just that uh, they sold it and, and it didn't stay in good hands. And so people just kind of raided the house. They would take the wood and uh, other items. And so you can actually tour that. And, uh, look online and find pictures of the Folly Mansion in Port Antonio, Jamaica. But thinking about that and seeing how it compares, it's not enough to build an elaborate, uh, beautiful edifice. It's got to be built on the right foundation. So if I hear Jesus and I follow his words, I am stormproof. And, and so how important that is. I want to be floodproof when it comes to, to the, the assaults of this life. And Jesus, notice, is going to almost say it's normal for the floods to come. There will be the rains, there will be the storms. The ones in verse 49 who heard and did nothing, 
heard what? The words of Jesus did not uh, respond in the appropriate way, like a man building his house without a foundation against which the stream beat vehemently. And immediately it fell, and the ruin of that house was great. And so Jesus pictures that with a challenge. Don't just hear what I've said. Hear and do. Uh, even some of these, as you think about the the weightier matters and the hard ones, the challenging things Jesus did, loving enemies, praying for them. And so Jesus says, whether it's easy or not, if hearing and doing, those two must be wed together. And so this is a 2,000 year old sermon with a modern application. I need to continue to, to know, uh, I need to first of all come to Jesus, uh, come to those gospels and that New Testament and and investigate, hopefully with an open mind, without biases. Uh, I'm gonna come and, and do those things and trust that if I do, then that I'll be like that house uh, built uh, on the rock and, and that strong foundation. Turning to the next chapter, Luke 7. Let's read this next section. It's Jesus heals a centurion servant. There's not another parallel in the other gospels. And a lot of these, at least Matthew, as a counterpart, sometimes Luke, not usually John, but but here's one that's a, a standalone. I, actually, I'm getting ahead of myself. That's not going to be until uh, Luke 7, 11 and following. This first section does, and it's Jesus healing a centurion servant. That is in Matthew chapter 8, 5 through 13. Let me read this, and we'll make some comment and make a couple of comparisons to Matthew's account. Now, when he concluded all his sayings in the hearing of the people, he entered Capernaum, and a certain centurion's servant who was dear to him was sick and ready to die. So when he heard about Jesus, he sent elders of the Jews to him, uh, pleading with him to come and heal his servant. And when they came to Jesus, they begged him earnestly, saying that the one for whom he should do this was deserving, for he loves our nation and has built us a synagogue. I'll stop there, just uh, roughly halfway through this account. Here's a man. He's a centurion, and I asked the, the question, what was a centurion? Well, by occupation, it's a, it's a military leader, not surprisingly, over a hundred men. And so we find century in the word centurion. Some of the commentators think that he could have been strictly Roman, could have been working for the Herods, who uh, were kind of the local authorities there, but but he has a servant, and this servant, in fact, some of the words translated there is, is not just like a house servant. It's not just uh, someone you would hire to, to do work for you. It's, it's more like even our slave, not saying that he was, uh, he was mistreated or lightly regarded. In fact, the Bible says that the centurion servant was dear to the centurion. Not sure how big that house was, but for a lot of people, especially if, if you've got family to look after, you've got a lot of men you're responsible for, a servant and his health or lack of it's not going to be high on my priority list. But if he's sick, uh, you know, next man up. Let's get someone that can do the job. But what a tribute to this man that he's concerned. It bothers him to the point that he's willing to take action. He wants this servant healed. That speaks again to the humanity, the compassion of the centurion. So he hears about Jesus. He is a Gentile. And yet he has Jewish friends, something that he's, if not a full proselyte to Judaism, he is at least sympathetic toward it, um, short of circumcision, which would be a, an obligation. He might have, have attended the synagogue and things like that. In fact, they feel well toward him. It's an amazing relationship because often there's animosity but he's sympathetic toward the Jews, builds them a synagogue. How about that? And someone says, you know what? I got some extra money laying around. How about a new nice house of worship? Free, no charge. Wow, wouldn't you be appreciative? And they say also about him that he loves our nation, the Jewish nation. And so he's wanting to come to Jesus. He sees or has heard about power, and yet he doesn't do it directly. Now, if you compare Matthew's account, in Matthew chapter 8, it has pictured the centurion talking directly to Jesus. Here it says that he sends, uh, he's kind of using the Jews as an intermediary. So someone says, is that not a contradiction? How do you reconcile those two? Let's keep reading. We'll, we'll address that in just a second. Verse 6, 
Then Jesus went with them, and when he was already not far from the house, the centurion sent friends to him, Jesus, saying, Lord, do not trouble yourself, for I am not worthy that you should enter under my roof. Therefore, I did not even uh, think myself worthy to come to you, but say the word, and my servant will be healed. For I also am a man placed under authority, having soldiers under me, and I say to one, go, and he goes, and to another one, come, and he comes, and to my servant, do this, and he does it. When Jesus heard these things, he marveled at him and turned around and said to the crowd that followed him, I say to you, I have not found such great faith, not even in Israel. Now look at the outcome. Verse 10 says, those who were sent returning to the house found the servant well who had been sick. Now, getting back to the question, uh, Luke seems to say that this is an indirect contact Jesus has with the centurion. Matthew represents it as, as more of a personal one. And could it be that, that originally the, uh, uh, the, the friends come to Jesus and finally the man, maybe sensing that Jesus is sympathetic to his plight, uh, goes out in person, and so they're they're looking at two different time frames of uh, the encounter there. The other possibility, and I would look at this as an explanation, not a way of trying to explain away a contradiction, is that in, in discussing with the friends, Jesus, uh, per Matthew's account, is is as if he's talking to the centurion because of the emissaries are the ones that uh, he sent, kind of as ambassadors. Not sure which is the best way to look at it, but I certainly would not look at this and say there's no way these two things could have happened. The big picture, here's a centurion's servant. Matthew's account says he's dreadfully paralyzed. He's tormented through his pain. The centurion cares about him. Jesus heals him. And it's this instantaneous healing. And uh, those that have looked at the story, you, you find about the centurion's servant there. And you marvel at the benevolence that uh, he had shown and the, the equal uh, good relationship it had with the Jews there. But to me, if I'm thinking about his compassion, uh, his, his humility, and he's saying about Jesus, you know what, I'm a man under authority, you are, or one having authority. And so he's not bragging on himself, I don't think, at all. I, I think he's simply saying, you know, Jesus, in your authority, if this is within your will, I'm, I'm asking you to do this. And so compassion and humility and faith, Jesus marvels. Only one other time in the Gospels is that used uh, in the Greek, probably the English as well. He marvels here at the man's belief, having found such great faith not in Israel. In Mark 6, verse 6, he marvels at their unbelief. The marveling, again, we think of as a, well, a disinhuman emotion. It's not that Jesus was caught by surprise, but just that he's, he's influenced uh, by that. And so Jesus is looking for faith. He wants me to display faith. And interesting that, that one, not even in, uh, in, in the family of God, not even one among the Jews, is serving as a great example of the power of Jesus. And then we segue to Jesus raising the son of the widow of Nain. This is in Luke 11, uh, chapter 7, rather, verse 11, down through verse 17. This is the one that doesn't have an account in the other Gospels. And so of interest here, Jesus raises the son of the widow of Nain. Uh, good question is, how many times does the, the Bible record that Jesus resurrected people? And the answer is three. And so Jesus raises a boy on this occasion, a son. We're not sure of his age. He raises a young girl. And then he raises John 11, Lazarus. And so a grown man. Different places, different circumstances. But look at this one. Let's investigate, explore a little closer here in Luke 7, verse 11. Now it happened the day after that he went into a city called Dane. Uh, the way we know where that is, this would have been uh, in the, the region there, the area of Capernaum off the Sea of Galilee. Many of his disciples went with him and a large crowd. That's kind of important as you think about eyewitnesses, about ones who uh, could give a testimony, sometimes supposed faith healers, and even ones who have purportedly raised the dead. Conveniently didn't have anyone really there to see it. 
didn't have any background confirmation. Uh, sometimes I guess they could uh, could convince um, people to to make up something and say, well, other people saw it, but but there were so many that would be a hard hard way to get around what happens on this occasion. He came near the gate of the city, and behold, a dead man uh, was being carried out, the only son of his mother, and she was a widow. I asked the question there, what led to the layers and sadness uh, in this loss there? Now, hear me well. I'm not saying that, that some deaths are worse than others. It's amazing when a celebrity dies, maybe household name and and news coverage goes into overdrive. It may be days, sometimes weeks, details about the funeral and all that. And, and you look at that and think, wow, that person uh, is human just like I am. Many of those people have no faith, no relationship with God, and yet they're mourned and held up as, as great people by their, their peers, while faithful Christians kind of laboring quietly in maybe a remote area die without any fanfare. And so every death is important because every life is important. And so thinking about layers of sadness, here is a woman who's already experienced loss. Her husband had passed away. Many of you know what it's like. You, you wear the label of widow. may not wear it well. You don't necessarily wear it easily, but, but you've lost your spouse. She has one son. That would have been a small family back then. Uh, certainly the, the average uh, number of children without uh, some of the birth control methods that are uh, commonly utilized today would have produced large families. She's got one son. And again, without giving his age, she would have depended on that boy. Uh, much as she was depending on her husband for, uh, for, for material support there, when he, uh, when he exits the picture by death, then the son is responsible, and now he dies. We don't know how many other family members she might have had. She might have had good support group. But, but imagine even just the, the emotional loss. Death is hard. It's much harder when it affects our family. We, we, we can have the picture of what loss looks like or what we think it would be like when others, but when it happens to us, it's a different ballgame. You know exactly what I'm talking about. And so feel with this woman and the losses that she's had. And she would not have, uh, again, Social Security or some of the programs uh, back then to, to kind of uh, step in and, and help the, the financial loss there. It says, a, a large crowd from the city was with her, and when the Lord saw her, he had compassion on her. Jesus saw this woman, didn't have to be informed about uh, when the loss took place, but compassion, beautiful word. It's an interesting word in the Greek. It's a word that we translate our entrails, our, uh, our insides, even our intestines, if you will. And so uh, the Greeks didn't know as much as we know or necessarily make the distinctions between the large one and the small intestine, but, but they knew the feeling that you feel when, when maybe you're stirred. Uh, for us, it may be a commercial we watch on television and there's a starving child or someone that's moaning in pain and... and there's that pit in our stomach. And so Jesus, uh, the, the Greek word for compassion is that, that inward feeling that we feel that's kind of love and, and remorse and pity all rolled into one. And so he feels that for her. And he says to her, do not weep. Now, Jesus, when people are crying today and mourning loss, it's not that he's unaffected or that he heartlessly would say something like that, but to her, it's do not weep. And I'm sure her response would be the only reason that you could tell me not to weep is if my son were still alive. That's exactly what Jesus has in mind here. He came and touched the open coffin. This is in Luke 7, verse 14. And those who carried him stood still. That would be an interesting disruption of the funeral. In fact, Jesus disrupted everyone he attended that we have record of there. And so he speaks these words, red letters. Young man, I say to you, arise. Young man, I say to you. He's talking to a body that had cooled by then. He's talking to a corpse. And he tells this dead young man to arise. Don't let the next verse surprise you. So he who was dead 
Isn't that interesting? He was he dead? Yeah. But but just temporarily he sat up and he began to speak. And he, Jesus, presented him, the son, to his mother. Wow. You could write paragraphs about what that would look like and, and go into detail about just the, the strong emotions, the tears of joy, and maybe the shock and surprise for the young man and all this commotion and what just happened here. And so Jesus was behind all that. He who was dead, dead, sat up. Uh, and began to speak. One question here, how would some try to explain away this resurrection? There are those that don't believe in any miracles not uh, performed by Jesus or any others, and so uh, maybe the boy just, he was in a coma, or uh, was just, a, just had a, just a flicker of life in him. They thought he was dead, and it was all a mistake, and so he, uh, he gets jostled there, and, and so uh, he just wakes up. It was a Interesting coincidence. That would be one way to explain it. To me, that is not a satisfactory way at all. And when you look at that, especially trusting the Bible accounts, uh, of all of them, we don't know how long it had been since the boy passed away, but Lazarus had been dead four days already, to the point the sisters said, there's going to be a stench. And so there's no way Lazarus, even if they thought he had died, and was uh, kind of entombed temporarily could have uh, withstood that. And so uh, these are, are meager, feeble attempts, I would say, to, to kind of explain away something very clearly that happened then. Watch verse 16. This is where we'll work toward close in this study today. It says, Fear came upon all, verse 16, all of them glorified God, saying, A great prophet has risen up among us, and God has visited his people. And this report about him went throughout all Judea and all the surrounding regions. Imagine if you were a first-hand eyewitness to someone resurrecting one who very clearly was dead. Would you keep that quiet? Would you go home if uh, you're away from your family and, and kind of um, someone asks you, well, how'd your day go or anything exciting happen? Mm, well, I can't think of much. Oh, I did see a dead person get brought back to life. No, they were thrilled by that. They responded the right way. That there was that, that that amazement at the power of a person who was able to do that, especially one who looked so much like them. Probably not in in these fancy, expensive clerical robes or, or priestly attire or anything like that. Just just an ordinary guy that called this boy back to life, and he lived. They were right as they glorified God, since it was from him, and as they esteemed Jesus as a great prophet, and God was visiting his people, indeed he was. And so for us, uh, the reaction of the people back then should be our reaction to be amazed by Jesus. Don't let uh, the zeal cool off about who he is and what his purpose is. And we get to continually tell people about the one who was able to raise the dead and, and bring sick folks back to life and make a change in us spiritually from sinner to saint. Not by virtue of anything within us, but by virtue of his, his sheer divine will. What an amazing thing this is. I'm loving studying Luke with you. Hope something challenged you in the next Time we meet, probably Wednesday at 7, we'll get back to John the Baptist sending messengers to Jesus. This is kind of a surprising part of Scripture. The little curveball is, is John is going to send messengers asking if Jesus is really becoming one, or do we look for another? I'm trying to reconcile how that John went earlier from proclaiming him as the coming one to either doubting or maybe trying to, to spur Jesus on to, to getting him out of out of his confinement. We'll explore that next time we study. God bless you. Thank you for your time together in, in the, the Word this evening. Have a good rest of your day.